March 2020, the headline says that the number of female CEOs in the Fortune 500 list hits an all-time high. There are 37 female CEOs in the Fortune 500 list. World Economic Forum says that it'll take about 208 years before women start getting paid same as men. 208 years to close the wage gap. Now, when we read these interesting facts, it'll be pretty stupid for us to ignore that something is not right. And somewhere there is huge influence of gender bias, either within ourselves or in the system. Now, to simply understand what gender bias is, it is nothing but a tendency to favor one gender over the other. And let's face it, the harsh truth and reality is that women are hit with it much harder than men. Today, we'll be talking about gender biases in workplaces and understand its true root causes. What are some small tweaks that we can do as individuals and in the system to see some massive results? And most importantly, what truly works for women at work? Today, I'm in conversation with Kamala Subramaniam. Kamala is an inspiring leader in tech and she has been in the corporate industry for more than 15 years. She has seen it all and she has been through it all herself. She'll be explaining everything about gender biases and how can we positively create a gender neutral work culture, thereby uplifting each other. Kamla Subramaniam, welcome on the show. Thank you, Sneha. Excited to be here. It is it is such an honor to have you on the show and uh, especially uh, the topic that we are going to be talking about today, the gender bias. And I feel there is no better person suited than you because the amount of, um, I think, knowledge and enthusiasm and passion that you have towards this topic. Uh, I wanted to talk about um, like gender bias in general and specifically uh, targeted more towards women uh, and what are the hardships and struggles that they go through and sometimes we talk about things which are in uh, in a way implicit we don't even realize that we are doing this uh, so I think with the help of this episode one thing we want to do is make people be aware uh, that what we should be doing as of today and secondly what will work for women in their workplace and that is where maybe we can start off with you so uh, Kamla you have been a uh, in the corporate industry for more than 50 years, sir. is that right? Uh, one five, not 50. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no one would even believe me if I said 50 <laughs> looking at you, but uh, yeah. no, no, absolutely. Um, so uh, I think one thing which I wanted to start us off with and uh, talking of gender bias, um, why do you think or like, you know, from history purpose, um, why do you think, like, what, what is the reason that gender biases exist in first place? So, uh, Sneha, I think this has got to do a whole lot of uh, history and social conditioning. Mm. So I think these are the two prevalent reasons why they exist and they exist so starkly today. Let's look back a little bit, right? Women weren't allowed to vote until the 1920s, right? Mm. Until the 19th Amendment came to light, which is where you're saying you're an equal status as a human being, so you're allowed to vote. And the reason that they weren't was because it was implied that women weren't able to make, you know, good decisions for the country. Mm. Until 1970s, a woman couldn't um, own a bank. Do you know why? Because they couldn't open a bank account or they couldn't have a credit card without wow. the permission of their husband. Why? Because it was implied that women were not capable of making sound financial distinctions. Hmm. Until the 1960s, women couldn't go to universities or Ivy Leagues and they could not become a lawyer even if they chose to. Again, it was implied that they were not of sound judgment as compared to their male counterparts, right? Mm. 
Uh, women were not allowed to talk about sex openly. Women were not allowed to breastfeed in public forums until the 1970s when uh, they came across a law which was basically saying you cannot discriminate against a woman who's choosing to breastfeed her kids in a public place. Mm. So that is the amount of history that has set us back over centuries, right? So let's look at where we are today, 2021. Um, according to the World Equality Forum, it's going to take 208 years to have gender equality here yeah. in the United States. Yes. We're not even yes. talking about the rest of the world, right? Yes. Uh, women make up a large percentage of Congress today, but that's still 25%. Mm. And the population of women are, is 50%, mm. right? We are not being represented where decisions are being made. Mm. In the Fortune 500 uh, companies today, there are far fewer women than men named James, mm. right? <laughs> so 208 years to get equality, that's a long time. It's a long time for me and it's a long time for my daughter, right? Mm. Excellent, excellent. I think uh, you've put it in a, in a wonderful way and uh, I think these facts and uh, nuances that you just mentioned, this is what people need to be aware of that uh, uh, like as you told like on a higher 10,000 feet picture we might not understand something but when you start looking at the smaller nuances like 208 years just to close the gender gap and I know that uh, chart that you're talking of from the World uh, e Economic Forum because uh, the same gap uh, originally like I think a year or two ago was that that gap will be closed by 2058. Uh, and then that number just drastically increased in past two years. So even 2058, that itself is like 25 years ago, 26, 70 years ago uh, after that, right? So uh, excellent. I think I think you have explained it in a wonderful way. And uh, yeah, I think it is important for everyone to understand that. Um, so Kamla, to ask you, um, talking of gender bias and uh the situation around it have you personally faced or experienced anything with respect to gender bias when you have been working i think in past 15 years in your workplace oh yes certainly uh there are many examples uh some absolutely hilarious mm. right um and some more uh you know coming from from inside your inner circle right mm. at work, which is a little bit more hurtful Mm. Uh, but a lot of these, yes, I've experienced them. And what is your initial reaction like when you go through that? Do you mind, do you mind sharing a story or something? Sure. So um, there is a popular conference called uh, NANOG that happens uh, every year. And uh, I remember this very nicely. It was in Seattle and I had flown out there. Um, it was a time where I didn't have kids, so I could dress nice. So mm. I was dressed nicely um, in high heels and a dress. Mm. And um, I, you had to go into these one of these uh, Hilton or one of these uh, places where they have these conferences, right? Mm. And you had to get your parking ticket um, kind of marked so that mm. you could basically get it reimbursed or you know validated. Uh, so I did that for myself. Um, somewhere in the afternoon, what happens is when the talks get over, you meet other companies. So um, at that time, I was working for a hyperscaler and we had a lot of vendors uh, who were coming in where we would evaluate their tech and we would figure out if this is what we're going to use in our network. Hmm. And uh, it so happened that I was early. So I went into this conference room. Uh, we had a bunch of pe people who were supposed to uh, come in and show up. So a few of the vendors uh, came in and uh, one of them, and I was making coffee, there was a co coffee pot in the side of the conference room. So I was making some coffee and one of them came in and, and very respectfully said, uh, hey, you know, I need to get this um, validated, this parking ticket validated. <laughs> what are you going to do? I mean, like, so it's really at that point, I had two choices, right? I either flare up, mm. right? Um, or I do this in a very nuanced fashion, right? Mm. And that day I was feeling a bit naughty, right? Okay. So I said, fine, because I knew all you had to do was, you know, go to this place, talk to a person, get it validated. So I took the apartment ticket. I went to the same place, got it validated. 
And I, by the time I came back to the room, folks from my company were already sitting in that room. Mm -hmm. And they said, huh, oh, yeah, okay, here's Kamla. And so she's the person you need to convince about yeah. your technology. And you could see the look on their faces, right? Mm -hmm. they, they knew they had made uh, an error uh, in judgment and they knew that their unconscious bias had completely popped up where they assumed I was either an admin for the hotel or mm -hmm. for my company or somebody that they could mm -hmm. uh, use to dispose of for such things, right? Um, so then I just casually handed them, uh, you know, their parking ticket. It's been validated. Now let's talk. Yes. Right. So you come back and you could feel the tension in the room. It was palpable. Um, and I was the only one who was not uh, uncomfortable. I was mm. very comfortable in what had taken place right there. Um, there was another instance where uh, a mentor of mine we, and me, we were both working very late. It was somewhere between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. And, uh, you know, he was walking out. And as he was walking out in a, you know, from a very well-intentioned place, he told me that, hey, you work too hard and too late. You need to go home. You know, your mm -hmm. kids are waiting for you. And I said, yeah, the kids are with your father. And, you know, he said, yeah, but kids need their mothers more. Mm -hmm. Right. And. To me, it was an affront, not just to me, but also to my husband, mm. who is a very good or even in many cases, the primary child care provider for my kids. Mm. So uh, it took I was so hurt that I couldn't respond at that time. So which is a good thing is to keep quiet and sort of lashing out in anger. Yeah. Uh, and I thought about it. And the next day I had a conversation uh, with uh, this mentor of mine saying, there's an implicit thing that women who spend too much time away from work are not good mothers, mm. but that's not true. I finish up my work. So when I go back, you know, I'm there for all the quality time that I need with them. Right. Okay. And so these are the things that I do. So these were a couple of examples. Yeah. Oh, lovely. And uh, I mean, uh, thanks for sharing those, those personal stories. And uh, uh, to, to some extent, I, I also feel, um, like there are a couple of thoughts that were going on in my mind while you were telling me these stories, right? Like for the first story, I think uh, no better slap than that. <laughs> like then just going with the flow and then coming and just showing what stance you truly have. I think there couldn't have been a powerful message that you could have given, right? Uh, uh, although, although I feel that also comes with your personality, right? Uh, the way you, uh, you, you carry your personality, the confidence, the the aura that you have around yourself and uh, I feel like and this is probably coming from my personal opinion and experience is that not everyone out there would be able to show that kind of charisma or style if I have to put it right and uh, majority of the times like I have known in uh, co-workers who have been in a situation or such stereotypes and uh, they told that I didn't know how to respond. I, I, I don't know how to respond. And uh, and that that is the problem. Like sometimes in your right mind, you might be able to answer it in the most classy way just due to it. Not everyone could do that. But uh, majority of the times it comes out as a lashing effect, as, as an anger or as a frustration. Sometimes it's a built up frustration from many such incidences and then it just blasts off on one person. And that person might be wondering, wait, what did I do? It wasn't much of a big deal. But yeah. it is it has a history behind it. Uh, thank you. I mean, this is this is great. Uh, and um, so so I think digging a little bit more deeper on that. So uh, from what I understood, you told one was how people uh, physically stereotype some things, like you know by your appearance and looks, or just like oh this is how it is. Uh, another thing is because you are a woman, there are some things that they have in their mind. Uh, do, do you have uh, such more examples or to, to ask you, what are some common types of stereotypes and biases that uh, commonly people face in their workplace and people, I mean, women? Yeah, it's a great question. And, I've, and one that I've spent a lot of years uh, trying to figure out. Um, mm -hmm. As a woman's leader in my current job uh, and speaking to many of them, like you mentioned, a lot of them do, just don't know what to do when they are in this situation, right? Mm. 
Um, what happens is there's an instance and there's a pattern. So I'm a very data driven person and I often look for patterns, right? Mm -hmm. Which is because patterns are easier to fix, right? They're easier to identify. And when you fix a pattern, you're actually solving a class of problems, not just that instance of a problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, I chanced upon this book called What Works for Women at Work. And mm -hmm. they pretty much articulated what was in my mind, you know, uh, over having looked at all of these uh, classes of instances. Mm -hmm. So gender biases are generally in four categories. Okay. okay. The first one is the prove it again, bias. Uh, what that really means is that women need to prove themselves twice as much to be even viewed as half as capable, wow. right? So um, men are usually given a new opportunity or a promotion based on potential. For women, it's based on performance. Mm. So sometimes you may have to keep proving the same thing over and over again, every job that you go to. Mm. The second bias is what's called a tightrope bias. Mm. And that is you're walking the line between being too masculine and being too feminine. Mm. So when you're too feminine, people usually say, ah, oh, you know, we don't take her very seriously, you know, and so they are liked, but they're not respected. Mm. When you come across as masculine, you could be respected, but you could not be liked. So in the same place, if a man is, um, you know, assertive, a woman could be aggressive. Right. Mm. A man is in control, but a woman is in control. So there's these certain nuances that come to it. But the truth of the matter is that in order to push forward in your career, you have to be both respected and liked. And yes. so there's this tight, you know, this type of uh, this tight rope that you are kind of walking. Mm. The third one is the maternal wall bias, right? Mm. Which is basically if you're a woman. Um, whether you're married or not, whether you're married and you intend to even have kids, mm. you're subjected to these bias that at some point, probably, you know, you may lose interest in your career or you may not have enough time to invest in your career. Wow. So, I mean, data proves, I said I'm a very data driven person, right? So data proves that, you know, if you have a mother's resume and another resume, the mother's resume is 80% less highly likely to be ignored. Okay. Uh, women are paid, uh, mothers are paid far less. Okay. Mm. And they are subject to very high, uh, you know, measures of punctuality and performance. Mm. Because you suddenly you are under this microscope where, you know, uh, not sure if this is your performance or is this the fact that you become a mother and you don't have enough time and then you become subject to more um, rigorous scrutiny around it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, studies also show that competent mothers in the workplace are actually less liked, right? Because uh, they are just, they have this aura about them that they bring in that I need to finish all of this because when I go back home, you know, I'm not going to be able to have the time. So they're able to compartmentalize, prioritize and get things done. Mm -hmm. And that somehow seems uh, to make them less likable. The final one is basically the tug of war, which is basically all of these three biases that create conflict within women itself. Hmm. Right. So, for example, prove it again. More experienced women basically, you know, try to have their uh, younger, inexperienced uh, folks, you know, kind of travel to the same rite of passage saying, hey, you know, it was so hard for us. So it should be that hard for you in order for you to be successful. Mm -hmm. But that's not really true. We've worked so hard to make it actually easier for the next generation, mm -hmm. right? Um, the maternal wall, right? There are often conversations, hey, you know, I came back from my maternity break in, uh, in six months, or I came back from my maternity break in six weeks. And yeah. somebody else was like, you know what? I was a lawyer and I was sending an email while I was being rushed to the OT, right? So these kind of things really kind of create, it puts your identity at risk, right? You don't understand, you know, how the pregnancy was difficult for another woman or what the family circumstances were at that time, right? Mm -hmm. um, the most common example for the tug of war is where women have this perception that there's just one place for them at the top. 
right? Because you the top is so male heavy anywhere you go. Mm-hmm. And I think, okay, they're going to have to get a woman for diversity's sake. So I'm going to fight to get to that spot. Mm-hmm. But the truth is, you know, like RBG said, right? When will you rest? You said, when there are nine Supreme Court women justices, right? It's so that it's the truth is how many of our positions are there? That's how many positions are available to women, not just one. Right? True, true, true. Very well said, uh, Kamla. And I love the four breakdowns. And uh, I think it, probably it's a must read for a lot of people out there. Uh, what works for women at work? Uh, that book sounds extremely interesting. And uh, I think from what I see, it is breaking down these individual aspects in a much more clearer way. And uh, like things like maternal wall and uh, other bias like tug of war or just the masculinity, femininity, uh, just just the thing, right? Um, so come now, follow up question on that now. Uh, and just probably being on the other side, right? Uh, one thing so there are two questions which i have now one is let's take an example uh, i know you mentioned that um many a times by data you have seen that a mother is ten like you know it is less likely to be given a higher performing job or a wage as compared to someone else right now uh, and this is my understanding so correct me if i'm wrong but someone who is making payroll out there is like you know like just making sure what effort and what money needs to be paid uh, i'm assuming no one is do you think people are uh, doing it uh, explicitly that okay you're uh, you're someone is becoming a mom uh, we should probably play pay less do you think th- that even happens or is it still again going back to our historical events of things that are going on uh, what are your thoughts on that to get a more clarification so no, so I don't think anyone can uh, explicitly do it, right? So mm. let's say you go and announce, hey, I'm going to be a mom in right. nine months. Right. It's illegal to actually go ahead and reduce the pay, first of all, right? Yes. People don't do that. What happens is a death by a thousand cuts that ensues after that, which kind of automatically results in uh, in your salary being reduced or your promotion, you know, being cut off or, you know, being pushed up ahead by two years, right? Got it. Things happen because you go on maternity break. So you've lost a few of the lush projects that could yes. be there. Yes. You come back and especially in the tech sector, things move so quickly, That's right? Tough. You need to ramp up a little bit more. Got it. And on top of that, motherhood is really starting to uh, come ahead, right? Because it doesn't end once you come back to work. You still need to go back. You still need to breastfeed. You still need to change the diapers. You still yeah. need to be uh, awake at nights, right? It's an ongoing process. Yeah. So a few things would happen. Like women tend to get exhausted mm-hmm. and they give up, yeah. right? Because the system is not set up for you to succeed in that fashion, totally, right? Totally. Um, and it's so relevant today in COVID times where you see women carrying more of the brunt because the housework, which we used to, the smart ones used to always say, okay, these are chores that I can actually, you know, delegate to somebody else. Yeah. Why not focus on what's important, right? Like, is it important for me to take my son to swimming or soccer practice and sit there while he's practicing? I'm not really, you know, spending quality time with him. So let me kind of delegate that to someone else. But I can sit for an hour with the homework, get that done or play board games yeah. or you know, swim with them together. So these are things that you could do, but you can't do that anymore in COVID times, right? Yeah. You're, you're doing the laundry, you're doing the dishwashing, you're doing the cooking, you're doing everything. Mm. So there is an insurmountable uh, load because of social conditioning that falls on a woman's plate as compared to a man's plate, right? Mm. Okay. So all of these can prove super exhausting, right? And then it really depends on how much perseverance you have to fight that bo- battle, right? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it may just be easier to give up and say, this is just way too much. It's overwhelming. And it is, right? So that's what I'm saying. It, what it is, is because the system is not set up for you to succeed. It's yep. a death by a thousand cuts. One way or the other, you're not going to succeed. Beautiful, beautiful. Very well. I think you hit the nail right in the head there. Uh, if you would have a live audience, sir, you would have gotten a standing ovation for that answer. Uh, but very well explained. I think this is what people need to understand and the system needs to understand that there are these small little opportunities that like, you know, 
people tend to miss out when they are either going on a maternal leave or they are busy uh, with other chores as like you know as you told as a woman as a mother it is needed to be done right uh, that does not mean that uh, opportunity should not be lined up for them that does not mean that we do not set them up for success there's a change that probably is needed in the system right so excellent so so i think that is a very well uh, explained uh, uh, a little bit more on a counter to that right so uh, not not counter but i wanted to talk so we are talking about explicit uh, actions right and uh, i also want to touch upon implicit actions which i think happen more often and probably most of the times it's the implicit thing that is there right so say uh if someone uh let's let's say me right you know uh sometimes as men uh like you know I, we have female coworkers we might not mean any harm or bad to for our coworkers but uh given the way we are probably brought up given the way our experiences and stuff have inculcated within us it is possible that there might be a situation or two where we end up being the that same person and we end up in that implicit bias situation right so given that this might be possible i think one thing which i want to understand is that what can the partner and when i say partner i mean the man or someone who is doing it not necessarily man and the opposite person who is taking this bias uh what is a healthy way to resolve that and come out of it yeah a great question sneha so you're right actually most of these biases that we see are implicit mm. and they are unconscious biases mm. right people are not aware that they are perpetuating them right? yeah yeah so unfortunately in this case the onus lies on us yes. to educate this right uh, so it's a twofold onus one is you except that this is actually well a well intentioned person okay and once you trust their intent it's easier for you to approach the second part of the onus which is basically now i'm going to educate this person okay. right okay and it could take on it's it could be something that you would say right there in a meeting right and it really depends on so you mentioned earlier that it comes easy to some people and it doesn't come easy to the others I would say that I'm here with years of practice, right? Mm-hmm. It wasn't easy then. Okay. Uh, yeah. I am more uh, extroverted and more assertive, so it's it's definitely easier for me to say it. But there's practice that can get you there, right? Mm-hmm. So some things could be as similar as a lot of times you're in a meeting and you've been subject to something, and you know you can feel your physical body changing your cheeks are flushing your heart beats gone up right you it's you feeling your cheeks burn and then you walk out of the meeting and then you're like oh i could have said that right like why didn't i think of it then you just you can't because your blood is not flowing in the right directions right mm-hmm. so you could just come up with a you know how a handy tip of what you need to do depending on if it's an intern or the ceo who's put you in in that position right mm-hmm. um, it could be something as simple as how rude right okay yeah. or this is not cool and that gives you time to buy gives you know buys you time to come up with the next correct appropriate response mm-hmm. and it buys that person time to say what was i doing which was rude or cool and then people just stop and they oh okay and then you you've changed you've taken that thing that you were talking about i don't know like the, the next you know coolest tack that you're going to innovate to something that's become a people problem right now in a meeting and it's focus on that so you've brought attention to that matter yeah. and it need not be rude it need not be rude it need not be rude at all yeah. right so you could just say you know the stolen idea which is the most common thing that yes. happens in a company like you say something and then 5 minutes later somebody else says it you know much more confidently and they're like yes. yeah we said it let's go after that right so and that's happened so many times that you know uh, i often either stick up for myself or for the other women in the room i'm like excuse me when she was saying she just said this about 5 minutes ago so maybe we should ask the originator of this you know to kind of detail that a little bit more okay. or say you know you were probably on your phone when i said this Right. but five minutes ago but this is exactly what i said right so there are ways that in a very calm and collected manner you can say that hey you just skipped over me yeah. you know over my idea 
you were not inclusive. And further down the road, you went ahead and picked it from somebody else who just seemed to have like a more uh, bass in his voice, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, mm-hmm. there are ways to basically bring that. Some people could be shy, you know, speaking to that in the meeting room. Mm. So you have to take the onus to go after that and talk to that person and then use a very situation behavior impact, Got you it. know. Here was a situation, we was in this meeting room for this particular uh, issue, mm. and this was your behavior. And the impact was that, you know, I didn't feel included. More yeah. importantly, this idea, so it has to be a problem that's bigger than yourself. It has mm-hmm. to be about the problem or the shared yes. objective, the business yes. objective that you're talking about. Yes. So when you were not inclusive of me, you were not inclusive of my idea. And so that is going to hurt this insert shared business objective, right? But the key thing is that, you need to keep talking about it. You need to let folks know um, what they did and what they can do better. And that's the only way you can uh, make change. Excellent. And uh, if if I have to summarize and just take the learnings from what you just said, first and foremost is from the women's side, uh, speak up. It's okay to communicate your problem, what you're feeling out there. Because if you don't speak up, the other person might not even know. Communicate that thing out there. It need not be rude, but in a more... Uh, proper way like now what fits for you based on your personality and secondly for others from our side i think one thing is that let's uh take it in a much more healthier way because a you were not aware of it in first place and secondly i think one uh thing that um i took from your conversation also is allyship that uh Sometimes you are in a meeting room, you might miss it, but if you feel and if you're seeing a problem, then let's be an ally to that other person and give the credit wherever needed and yeah. also empower each other because that is the only way we are going to be uplifting each other. Yeah. Right? Okay. Lovely. So uh, now, Kamla, a point blank question to you here. Uh, do you think um, the all these biases and the cultural norms that we are forming at workplace. Um, do you think system is at fault here? Is there is there a biggest bigger blind spot that we are missing? There were two questions there. So yeah. let me answer the first one about the system and then let me get to the blind spot one. Okay. Right. So the system is uh, yes, there's a problem mm. and there are two ways to solve that problem. Fix the woman or fix the system. Hmm. A lot of the time, the knee-jerk reaction or the easier path is to fix the woman. But the right solution is to fix the system. So let's look at a few examples of this, right? Women make 80 cents to a dollar. If you're trying to fix a woman, you would say, hey, you need to negotiate better. You need to speak up. You need to go up for promotions more often. You need to change jobs more often. Hmm. But when you are trying to fix the system, you're literally looking at all the metrics that you have to see if these are issues here, right? You want to make sure that there is equal, everybody's portfolio is equal in terms of the kind of amount of work. The opportunities that they have Mm. are equal, right? So that is how you fix the system, right? Or, you know, hey, uh, women don't belong in leadership roles. They don't have the skill sets to do that. So fix the woman, oh, you need to become more assertive, you need to speak up more, you need to be more like a man, okay? Mm. But fix the system really looks at the skills that women bring, right? Mm. Skills of empathy and compassion and really leading teams from the ground up rather than, you know, just from yourself all the way up, right? Um, Women quit uh, quicker, either after they become mothers or after they've reached a certain level, Fix the women as old women, you know, it's, uh, they just, they they are more interested in rearing kids or they're not really cut out for, you know, what happens when you climb up the ladders. Mm -hmm. The truth is that women got, have been burnt out, right? When you're having to try to prove yourself over and over again through the different levels, you're just burnt out so much. So you just don't have it in you. So fix the system is basically looking at real metrics to see, you know, what the performance is that, all genders are either based, are either, uh, you know, scrutinized on potential or yeah. on performance, not one or the other, yeah. right? So that is about fixing the system. And your second question was the blind spot. Um, 
I do think that we are as uh, as an industry, and even you know, if you look at the tech industry, we're missing out something uh, very important, and that's the coming back to the two hundred and eight years. There are fewer women in tech. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there are uh, more women in universities today, but there are fewer women in tech in the universities. Mm. Okay. Okay. And so then they basically uh, figured out, okay, all this data is pointing us to a place where you need to start at the grassroots level, mm. which is great, right? Yeah. But I believe that that is where the 208 years gap is coming from. And this is just my personal intuition based on the data that I have looked at, yeah. uh, which is basically you're saying, let's go to elementary schools and middle schools and high schools, you know, set up camps for girls uh, who code, you know, kind of help them through that, give them talks to encourage women to get into STEM discipline, you know, make sure that your high schools have enough number of girls who are in the STEM discipline and then go to the universities and all, you know, it's 208 years. Wow. Okay. So I think that the biggest blind spot is what can we do? Keep doing that. Great work, right? Um, but you really want to, you know, like we got to vote in 1920s. Do I want to wait another 200 years to have to go in a room with 50% women? No, right? It should be faster than that. And for that, we need to look at women already in the industry today, right? Yeah. You have bias pipelines staring at you every time, right? Yeah. Um, which is basically if you have for one open position, you probably get nine males, you know, one female, right? So you're starting off with a pipeline that is uh, biased, yes, right? Yeah. And so there are two things. Women in the professional lives, there's, think of it as a conduit, a pipeline. The start of that pipeline is basically hiring, right? Mm. So that's how you actually increase your metrics. The rest of the pipeline is managing the attrition, right? And making sure that women don't fall out of the pipeline, that they're growing through this pipeline, right? Okay. So and in order to do that, you really have to put some key measures in place. If you're going and hiring a position, whether that is in an intern or a VP or a CEO, make sure that you have not closed that position until you have you know, interviewed a few diverse candidates, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a small step, which can actually increase, like it's a aggregation of marginals, right? If everyone across the board does it, then that's going to, be fantastic right yeah and, and you and every hiring manager does that then it's simply a matter of aggregation of marginals you're just going to grow in numbers right there true i mean i think just from what i understand is start making tweaks and changes in the smaller levels and then like suddenly you will start seeing changes at a much 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 higher level automatically yeah. one interesting article that i read is that uh that women and I don't know how where the data is coming from. So, but I'll try to find that article. Uh, and it said that uh, women tend to self-reject themselves on a much higher scale as compared to uh, men. Uh, like men out of ten, even if like uh, seventy percent of the skills are matching, they're like, okay, yeah, I'm going to apply. Uh, like, so why, why is does self-rejection play a role in that? Yes, I do think that. Uh... The, the consciousness is much higher, right? Okay. So what happens is if you have like 10 skill sets required, right? Yeah. And women will look to see if they have nine or 10, yeah. right? Before they apply for a job. The men for reasons of their own, they say, I have six. I'm going to, you know, really knock the job out of the park. <laughs> I'm there, right? And the same thing happens when you're looking at promotions, right? When women are going up for promotions, they're more conservative. They're like, maybe I'll just wait another cycle. Maybe I'll just wait another year and get all of this ready. Or maybe I'll wait for my entire village to say, yes, you're ready for promotion and not just a subset yeah. of them before you go. There's a lot of self-guessing and stuff like that. But that's fixing the woman. Like you, we, each one of us can individually do it, but we need to fix the system again, that's which is good. basically... If a woman goes up and says, you know, I'm underpaid and I want this number, or if uh, I want to go off for promotion, right? They, the system should not kind of uh, penalize them for saying, oh, you're too self-serving yeah. or you're too yeah. aggressive. And that happens a lot, right? So, and then you kind of back down and then you become a little bit more shy and yeah. you say, okay, 
you know, let me just collect all of this before sure. you I go up for promo. And that's not really true. Right. So. Good. Good. Awesome. Yeah, I think uh, again, I think the key is to communicate. Uh, if you are in doubt, probably communicate with your manager, communicate with your peers and understand where you are actually residing because you might be much more worthy than what you might think. And that applies for like, you know, any anyone for that matter in the industry. Uh, excellent. So uh, we talked about the system, a follow up, of course, you know, I was going to ask. Uh, let's talk about um, what can like, you know, one uh, a woman if already in the workplace can do. Right. So from your experience, you have been uh, you've seen different types of situations and uh, experiences. Right. So what do you think works for women? Um, I think you, um, one part of addressing the problem is saying, Hey, you know, there's a gender bias. There's nothing I can do. You know, this is history. There's a lot of fault. There's a lot of social conditioning and yeah. stuff. While that absolves you of the responsibility, it does not absolve you, unfortunately, of the accountability in the fixing of the game. So there's a large part of it where you need to recognize that, this thing is going to keep happening over and over again. Mm -hmm. And the way you're able to handle it with less stress is really how you're going to come out of this successful. Bingo. Right. You just assume that this is part of your job. So take more control of your destiny into your own hands, which is basically if you're not happy in your job, right? And if you've communicated that enough, then now it's your responsibility to find another job. Right. And so it yeah, things like that, like the, for example, let's walk through what we can do in all these four biases. Right. Mm. So the prove it again bias is basically when your idea is stolen from you, speak up. Right. Keep metrics every time of what you're doing. Right. Sometimes even end of day, real time metrics saying today I did this. Right. So when it comes time to speak about it, you know, when performance evaluations are happening, you can actually speak to data, right? And then don't feel shy about speaking about everything that you've done because that's the time to speak about it. But more importantly, form a posse, right? Or a sphere of influence where you have other people, could be a combination of both women and men who are actually speaking for you, right? And that's really good. Um, the, the, the title, right, where the masculine versus the feminine. A lot of women tend to take on a lot of what's called as the uh, household work in the office, which mm -hmm. is like arranging summits, shrags, happy hours, or even undervalued work, right? You know, internship committees or research committees and stuff. These are things that are good to do, but too many of them on your plate will actually take away time from what you need to do to impact your business, right? Yep. So in that case, you should say, hey, you know, um, uh, I, I love this. I think this is a great idea, but here are the things on my plate. And you know what? I did this last time. So maybe James down, you know, the aisle would like to do it this time and make yeah. sure it's keep a rotating system there and keep, sure, you know, make sure that that is a thing. Um, for the maternal wall, right? I think it's important to understand that each one has their own uh, story, their own journey, right? Yeah. And it's kind of uh, unfair to have one rule that applies to all of, all the women. So yeah. I think for me, the biggest thing is I have a great posse at work, but I have a strong posse of women. Because when you stop working for yourself and you actually start working for a higher order of thing, which is for all of your gender, the kind of uh, relationships and the support that you form is just you know, the magnitude of that is so high really? that it really kind of champions everyone in that in that sphere of influence. Right. So those are these are some things that you can do and definitely, you know, ramp up with mentors. Right. Uh, strong yeah. women mentors are one way to go about it, because it turns out that almost everyone goes through the same problems and how they solve it is different speak to yeah. four or five of them right because each one would give you a perspective of how they pick one that works for you and your personality and go with that right very well said kamla very well said and uh, and i love the uh, i i love how 
all this entire answer the way you have given is it has a great positive and an inspiring touch to it that uh that it's 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 not that complicated to get to just bring it in your hands you can take the onus of it and you can fix it like you no know, things that are in your hand things that are at a system level sure m- many people need to be involved and everyone needs to be aware and that might take time but it will we'll get there we'll uh, we i'm optimistic in that that we will get there but i love how you have inspired in a way that you know you can start doing something today also like you know and that is that is what really matters uh, so coming to the last segment of the show kamla this uh, jo as you know it's called it's not that complicated and uh, the whole idea is that to talk about such tough topics and uh, topics that have not been talked about like gender biases and stuff and make it simple for people to understand make them be aware of it more so if i have to ask you uh, what are some three cta's three call to actions that you would recommend for people to start doing today both men and women uh in order to make sure that we create a more gender neutral workplace environment and a culture what would you say yeah so um i would you know i would address this to the majority of the population right so the majority of the population i'm assuming are folks who don't want to spend a substantial amount of time trying to change the gender yeah. bias in the industry but really how are you dealing with it sure. and then how are you making sure you're not dealing it to somebody else the ally right so i'm going to focus the call to actions there sure. so it's simply speak up more right and speak up in a very rational manner uh the more you let it build up the more angry you're going to come and then you're going to say oh you're just a raging idiot at work what you should be able to say in a very calm and collected fashion is if i appear angry to you it is because i am angry because of what you did just now jeopardize and insert the your shared you know business objective or mutual understanding right there right got it and it is totally okay to say in a very calm fashion i'm angry because you did this rather okay. than screaming your head off right okay. uh, make sure you go ahead and start building your posse right Lovely. who is your of influence and for folks who uh you know who are allies if ever you're confronted with someone saying hey i was in this meeting and you spoke over me just bring a very open uh mindset to it right uh with an understanding that yeah uh this person at some point did not feel included did not feel seen did not feel heard so what am i going to do better next time right so these were the two i think minimal things that we can take away from this conversation totally totally thank you so much kamla i think those are some wonderful ctas easy uh, speak up uh, whenever you are in a situation create your posse and for those allies out there make sure that you are there in that meeting room or wherever you are and empowering each other and supporting each other because we're not going to do this alone we are going to require help at every single stage is that right lovely kamla it was such an honor talking to you today i had a blast and thank you for coming on the show Yeah, thank you for having me Sneha. I had a blast too. See, it's not that complicated. Every week we come up with such interesting and fantastic topics and make it simple for you to understand. So before you go, make sure you press the subscribe button. Subscribe right here. Yes. <laughs>